Welcome. The goal of this video is to introduce the logic part of the course. So first I'll be kind of giving you a flavor of what mathematical logic is all about, and then I'll tell you what we'll be seeing concretely in the course. Now it's always really hard to summarize succinctly what a whole field of math is about without going into the details. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you an analogy to mathematical logic, which deals just with numbers. And hopefully this will illustrate some of the key points that we'll encounter later in our study of logic. So to set the scene, suppose we're living in a world where people are super into numerology. So that's the idea that numbers, the properties of numbers somehow have an immediate influence on, uh, on things in the world. Okay, so in this setting, we have some set of numbers. For simplicity, let's choose the natural numbers. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. And we're just considering this thing here as a set at the moment without any additional structure. And now because in our world, everyone's super into numerology, we have opinions, very strong opinions about these numbers. In fact, we're going to go so far as to say that certain of these numbers are good and certain of these numbers are bad. So we have over here our set of values, namely bad and good. So these are our values. And we assume that for each number, we have some opinion about it. So we're assigning it either good or bad. And for the sake of concreteness, just so we, that we have something concrete to think about, our assessment of a number will depend on its parity. So we're going to ask whether a given number is even or not. And we'll say that if it's even, it's a good number. And if it's not, it's a bad number. Okay, so we have uh, our setup here. We have this set of numbers. We have our set of values. And we have some function which assigns to each number its corresponding value. Now let's stretch our imagination a bit further and imagine that it's really hard in our world to determine whether a number is even or not. But because the meaning of numbers has such a great influence on our lives, we want to be able to produce as many good numbers as possible. So we'd like to design some procedure which allows us to generate new good numbers based on old good numbers. And we want this procedure to have the guarantee that whenever we start with a good number, we end up again with a good number. On the other hand, we're not too interested about the bad numbers. So if we start with a bad number, we're not going to force our procedure to produce a good number. We're just going to say that if we start with a bad number, the result of our procedure could be either a bad number or a good number. We're not doing any guarantees on that. Now, because determining whether a given number is even is a difficult task in our world, we would ideally like to have some sort of mechanical procedure that just operates on numbers. So one example of such a procedure would be the following. We take the number and we just add two to it. So here, if we start with zero, we apply the plus two procedure and get two, or we start with two and apply the plus two procedure and get four. On the other hand, if we start with one, which is a bad number, and we apply the plus two procedure, we end up with a bad number, three. But as you can see here, and as you can extrapolate, whenever you start with a good number here, uh, and you add two to it, you again get a good number. So this orange procedure here would be a sound procedure in our world. Now again, the advantage of having this procedure is that if we know that we are starting with a good number, let's say someone has checked that zero is a good number, well then we can just keep applying this procedure and we get more good numbers for free basically without ever having to check whether they're even. On the other hand, if the person who gave us the starting number made a mistake and accidentally gave us a bad number, well, then this procedure is not guaranteed to produce more good numbers. On the other hand, here in this simple example, it's pretty easy to come up with a procedure that always gives you good numbers regardless what type of number you start with. One such rule is multiplying by 2. So if we multiply 0 by 2, we get 0. If we multiply 1 by 2, we get 2, and so on. If we multiply 2 by 2, we get 4. And by the definition of what it means to be an even number, you can see that you're always going to get even numbers regardless what type of number you start with. All right, so I've given you this hypothetical scenario in this weird world where we care about numerology. So what does this have to do with logic? Well, what I'm trying to illustrate here is the division between syntax and semantics and how they interact. So here on the left, this would be called the, the syntactic world. So the world of syntax 
where in our case, we're just performing arithmetic operations on numbers. Now, the reason this is called syntax in logic is because in logic, we won't be dealing with numbers here, but rather with logical formulas, which form a type of language. And so the operations on these formulas, which are purely in terms of the, the structure of the language are called syntactic. On the other hand, here on the right, we have our values, and these are semantic, which means having to do with meaning. So in our numbers example, we're assigning meaning to numbers by saying whether they're good or bad. And in the example of logic, we'll be assigning truth values to certain uh, formulas. And generally, we'll be saying that uh, formulas are either true or false. Now, what I've tried to illustrate here is that in this setup, what we're doing is we're separating syntax from semantics. So we have these rules here in orange and blue that are purely syntactic. So in order to use these rules, we don't ever have to know whether a given number is even or not. So we never have to move over to the semantic side. But if we've designed the rules correctly, as we have in this case, we're guaranteed to always obtain good numbers if we start with good numbers. Okay, to complete this analogy for logic, let's uh, draw the analogous things we'll have there. So in logic, we'll have logical formulas replacing the numbers. And then instead of having this good or bad, we'll have, we'll have false and true on the semantic side. So these would be our truth values. And there is going to be some function which assigns each logical formula a corresponding truth value. So let's say that these formulas here maybe are called P, Q, and R, and so on. And these could be uh, like also more complex things built up of other formulas. And the thing that's going to correspond to these, these procedures here that were purely arithmetic in our numbers example, these are going to be certain rules of proof. So this blue arrow here is going to be some proof rule. Now the idea is that we want to construct some proof calculus here on this syntactical side of the logical formulas. And we want these proof rules to um, satisfy the following property that whenever we start with a true formula and apply a proof rule, we again get a true formula. So we want these proof rules to be truth preserving. Now, the reason this is useful is that, well, just staring at a formula here um, and trying to deduce its truth value might be really difficult. Whereas applying these proof rules, this would be like a purely mechanical procedure that uh, should be less difficult. Okay, so this is our setup. And well, this type of setup immediately raises some questions, which will be some of the central questions that we'll be answering in our study of mathematical logic. So the first question is, are the rules sound? Here, sound means that whenever we start with a true formula and apply a proof rule, we again obtain a true formula. Or in our numbers example, whenever we start with a good number and apply the, the arithmetic operation, we end up with another good number. So that's what soundness means. Soundness basically just means that whenever you start with something good, you can't move to something bad by using the rules. Another question we can ask is whether the rules are complete. And here, completeness means that we have enough rules or the right type of rules to reach any true proposition. Now here in the numbers example, you can see that the blue rule is complete in the sense that whenever you choose an arbitrary even natural number, there exists some other natural number such that when you apply the rule to it, you land at the, the given one. Now we could have devised rules which are sound but less complete. For example, we could have had the rule where we always multiply a given number by four. And in that case, you see that the image of this operation will only be, well, multiples of four, which aren't all even numbers. Okay, so the next question we could ask whether our rules are minimal. So here I'm assuming that we have some set of rules and minimality of this set would mean that whenever we remove one of these rules, we're like losing some of the things we can uh, deduce. For instance, here, this set of two operations, the 
the orange and the blue one on the numbers is not minimal because we could remove the orange rule and we'd still manage to get all of the good numbers. And having such a minimal set of rules would be desirable because we're reducing the complexity of our, in this case, of our arithmetic procedures. Now the final thing we could ask is whether there is some decision procedure for determining whether a number is even, or in this case, determining whether a logical formula is true. So by this I mean that we want some procedure that takes a number and in a finite number of steps determines whether it's good or not. Or in the case of the logical formulas, we are given some arbitrary logical formula and in a finite number of steps we want to be able to determine whether it's true or false. Now if we have such a decision procedure we can also ask about its complexity. So what I mean by this is its computational complexity, so how long will it take to reach a decision? We'll see, for example, in the case of propositional logic that we have a decision procedure for determining whether a given proposition is a tautology by using proof tables, but unfortunately that procedure scales with 2 to the power n for n being the number of atomic propositions occurring in your formula. So this is like an exponential growth type thing. And so if you have a large number of uh, atomic propositions in your formula, it's going to take a very, very long time uh, to determine whether it's true or false. And in fact, it doesn't take very many atomic propositions for you to reach like the age of the universe scales of time it would take to determine whether that formula is true or false. So typically in logic, like actually deciding whether a given formula is true or false is a is a difficult thing to do in contrast to determining whether a number is even or not. And that's basically the reason why we really care about these proof rules because once we've established certain things as true, it's much easier to just apply proof techniques to get more true things than it is to, from scratch, decide whether a given uh, proposition is true or not. Okay, so I hope that this sort of uh, broad informal introduction has given you some ideas about what to expect. Now before moving on, while I have these pictures drawn like this, I can't resist uh, showing you that mathematical logic also has an algebraic side. What do I mean by this? Well, if you look at this picture over here, you see that we have some set with some arrows between uh, the different points in the set. And we can interpret these arrows as being an order relation. So here this isn't the typical ordering on the natural numbers, instead we have um, an ordering where 0 is less than or equal to 2, and 2 is less than or equal to 4, but for example, 0 is not less than or equal to 1. So basically here we're just interpreting these arrows here as being the, the relation determining the order um, on the set. Now in order for this to be a proper order structure, we need it to be transitive and reflexive. So actually what we're considering is the transitive and reflexive closure of the structure indicated by these arrows. So what I mean by this is that we always add arrows going from each point to itself if they don't already exist. And whenever we have two arrows, like here, um, we uh, also add an arrow that goes directly from the starting point of the first arrow to the end point of the second arrow. So in any case, we can interpret the procedures we've defined in our set as inducing an order on that set. Moreover, I can also put an order structure on this set of values over here. Namely, I let bad be less than or equal than good. Also, I let bad be less than or equal to itself, and good be less than or equal to itself. And now what one can notice is that the rules I've defined here are sound precisely when this function that assigns each number its truth value is order preserving with respect to these orders we've defined. So what does this mean concretely in our case? Well, being order preserving means that whenever we have some number here on the left being less than or equal some other number, then the images of those numbers also satisfy the corresponding inequality here on the right. For instance, here zero is less than or equal to two here on this side, 
And therefore, the image of 0, which is good, needs to be less than or equal to the image of 2 on this side. But now there's only one arrow emanating from good, so good is only less than equal itself. Therefore, in order for this map here to be order-preserving, whenever we start with a good number and have an arrow going out of it into another number, that second number also needs to be a good number. And this is precisely the soundness of the rules we've constructed here. On the other hand, if we start with a bad number, so this is mapped to bad over here, then the result of applying one of these arrows here on the left is allowed to be another bad number because we have an arrow going from bad to bad. But it could also be a good number because we have this arrow here going from bad to good. So essentially the order structure over here isn't constraining what happens with bad numbers, it's only constraining what's happening with good numbers, namely that they need to be mapped to further good numbers using the procedures here on the left. Now of course the exact same thing holds by analogy for our truth values and our set of logical formulas. We can think of our proof rules as inducing an order on the set of logical formulas, and the proof rules are sound precisely when this map here that assigns each logical formula its truth value is order preserving with respect to this order that I've put on the truth values. Okay, so that was just an aside. If this doesn't appeal to you or you didn't quite understand what was going on there, don't worry about it. Um, I just wanted to mention that also we can view mathematical logic through this more algebraic perspective where we're basically kind of looking at certain maps between uh, ordered structures. And I really like this perspective because somehow it allows you to generalize certain ideas from logic to other types of situations which on the surface maybe don't appear like they're logical in nature, but actually the situation is very similar in the sense that we have certain structures which we can interpret as being ordered and we want certain orders on these structures to be compatible and so on. Okay, so after this sort of very vague introduction about what mathematical logic might be about, let's turn to precisely what topics we'll be covering in this section of the course. So essentially, we'll be studying two types of logic. The first one is called propositional logic, and the second one is called first-order logic. So in propositional logic, we'll basically just be considering certain statements which are either true or false, and we'll be building more complicated statements based on certain atomic statements. So these statements are called propositions. So here we have some propositions, which sometimes we'll call like P, Q, and R, and so on. And then we also have some connectives. So these are logical connectives that take various propositions and glue them together to a compound proposition. And the connectives one usually considers are negation, uh, the conjunction, so and, disjunction, or, and implication, which is indicated with this arrow, and then equivalence, which is indicated by the double arrow. Now, an example of a formula written in propositional logic could be the following. So we could have r and not i implies c. Here we can interpret the atomic propositions as follows. So this could be rain, I could stand for indoors, and C could be clouds. So then this statement here would be interpreted as, well, if it's raining and we're not indoors, then there must be clouds. Okay, so that would be a simple example of propositional logic and the type of statement we could express using it. So it'll turn out that this propositional logic here is not, in fact, expressive enough to do any interesting math in. So we'll have to move to a more complicated system, namely that of first-order logic. And one way to think about first-order logic is that it somehow replaces these propositions here with certain relations on a given set of things. Okay, so that might sound a bit mysterious. What do I mean by this? Well, here a proposition could be, for example, 2 is an even number. But as mathematicians, we don't just want to make these type of specific statements about specific elements in a set and their properties. We sort of want to make general statements about arbitrary elements in a set with certain properties. So really what we'd like to say is something like x is an even number, 
but this x then is somehow an element of a set, so we need our logical language to be able to include reference to certain elements in a set. And so we're kind of breaking down these atomic propositions here further, and instead we're defining these propositions in terms of certain relations or properties of elements of sets that we start with. Maybe it's just easiest to give an example of a formula and then discuss a bit what I was talking about before. So a formula in first order logic would be something like for all x, for all y, if f of x is equal to f of y, then x must be equal to y. Okay, so this expresses the injectivity of the function f. And we see that, well, in this case, this is certainly something we would care about when we're doing math. So now let's compare this formula here in first order logic to the one of propositional logic from above. So we see that we have this new type of element here, which is called a quantifier, which is pronounced for all x. Another difference is that we are now referencing some, some sort of variables. So when I'm saying for all x and for all y, f of x equals f of y implies that x is equal to y this x and this y somehow are variables that refer to certain elements of a set. And this is different from these atomic propositions above here. These atomic propositions are certain statements which are either true or false. Here, these variables aren't true or false by themselves. They're just um, variables that can take values of certain elements that live in a specific set that we're going to determine later when we want to interpret this formula. Another difference here is that we have this equality symbol and also we have this function symbol. So these are things that can't occur in propositional logic formulas. So in our case we can never say that two propositions are equal to one another. All we can say is that they're like logically equivalent using this connective here. However, because these variables here are referring to certain elements in a set, we can use all the structure in that set to compare them. For instance, in any set, we always have equality, but then we might also have different additional relations on our set or functions on our set that we can use uh, in order to compare elements. For instance, here I'm using this function f here to compare the image of x with the image of y under f. On the other hand, we see that we retain certain aspects, so we have this implication. And this is the same type of logical connective from above. So what I was saying before is that somehow here in this first order logic formula, we've broken down the atomic propositions from propositional logic even further. For instance, we can uh, interpret this statement here, this f of x equals f of y, this could be some type of proposition p, and this x equals y could be some proposition q. This doesn't quite work because we need the quantifiers uh, in order to bind the variables. So usually one would write something like pxy here and qxy since it's like a certain property of x and y, or maybe like a predicate on x and y, and we still need to quantify over all x and y in order to make this like a statement which is either true or false. Otherwise, the, its truth value could depend on which x you choose or which y you choose. And in the case of injectivity, we want this thing to hold for all x and y's in our set, not just specific ones we choose. So in this view, we can somehow interpret first order logic as a refinement of propositional logic, which incorporates reference to certain elements of sets. Okay, so I hope that this cursory overview gives you some idea about what propositional logic and first order logic could be like. The way I'm going to approach this is that I'm going to first cover each of these topics in a naive manner. So first we're going to look at naive propositional logic and then second we'll look at naive first order logic. What I mean by this is that we're not going to go into any details um, of the formalization of all of this. I'm just going to kind of explain um, these topics in a manner that you might have seen in like a first year course in math that wasn't specifically dedicated to mathematical logic. So here in the first naive part on propositional logic, basically we'll just be defining the connectives in terms of truth tables. 
And then we'll be seeing that we can determine the truth value of such a compound uh, proposition here based on the values of the atomic propositions occurring in it by just writing down truth tables. And in the part on naive first order logic, I'll show you how you properly can construct um, these types of formulas and how you can interpret them. And then in the third part, we'll also be doing some naive proof theory. So this is basically just how to prove um, first order logic statements uh, based on certain proof rules, which are also the type of rules you would learn in like uh, a first year course in math that isn't specifically focused on logic. So the type of thing I mean here is the following, like if we wanted to pr prove this formula here for injectivity, we see that we have these quantifiers here. So the first step in the proof would be to take an arbitrary element x and an arbitrary element y, and then prove the statement here for those two arbitrary elements. And if we can do that, then we've proved this entire compound state. Now, the reason this is naive is because we're just sort of handed these rules of proof and we kind of just have to accept that they work. Okay, so that will conclude the naive coverage of these topics. And then in a second pass, we'll be doing these things more formally and in such a way that we can actually uh, prove certain theorems about, uh, about these objects in question. So if you think back to this analogy with the numbers I gave in the beginning, the naive version of the theory is basically just we're handed certain procedures and people are promising us that they work and we're just learning how to apply them. Whereas in this second more thorough pass, we're actually going to build enough theory to prove that they, that they do in fact do what they're promising. So for instance, we'll prove that our proof theory is sound, we'll prove that it's complete and so on. But of course this will require specifying much more precisely what we're talking about and it'll be more complicated than just this naive version where we're just trying to like apply things. Okay, so in the second part of the course, we'll be doing like proper propositional logic. So let's call this uh, propositional logic done right. And the same thing for first order logic. Okay, so if you only stay for the yellow bits, so these naive parts here, then you'll have learned how to prove first order logic formulas by the end, which is basically all you need in order to construct proper mathematical proofs. But if you want to stick around and learn more about like why these procedures work and how to like think about them properly, then stick around for parts four and five, where we'll dive deep into the theory of mathematical logic and actually prove these things proper.